Happy Tuesday. Good afternoon, everyone. So before I uh, turn things over to Jake, I have a couple of updates at the top, and then we'll get this going. So this afternoon, President Biden will award the Medal of Honor, America's oldest and highest recognition for valor, to Captain Larry L. Taylor, United States Army. On June 18, 1968, then First Lieutenant Taylor led a helicopter team in Vietnam that rescued a four-man Army patrol unit, which had been surrounded by nearly 100 enemy forces. First Lieutenant Taylor and his wingmen braved intense ground fire for more than 30 minutes to provide aerial, aerial fire support until they were nearly out of ammunition. With the enemy still closing in on the patrol, First Lieutenant Taylor courageously decided to extract the team of American soldiers on the ground using his two-man Cobra helicopter, a feat that had never been accomplished or even attempted. First Lieutenant Taylor landed his helicopter under heavy enemy fire and with complete disregard for his personal safety. He successfully rescued the patrol team and carried them to a safe location. First Lieutenant Taylor's conspicuously gallantry, his, found, his profound concern for his fellow soldiers, and his actions, which went above and beyond the call of duty, are in keeping with the highest tradition of military service. In recognition of his service, he will be awarded the Medal of Honor here today at the White House this afternoon. Now, as you all know, the president believes that education beyond high school should unlock doors to opportunity, not leave bars stranded with debt they cannot afford. That's why from day one, the Biden-Harris administration has been working to fix the broken student loan system, make college more affordable, and cancel loan debt for millions of borrowers. In fact, to date, the Biden-Harris administration has canceled more than $117 billion in loan debt for 3.4 million borrowers. And earlier today, the Biden-Harris administration announced that more than 4 million student loan borrowers are enrolled in the administration's new income-driven repayment plan, the Saving on a Valuable Education or Save plan. This includes those who were transitioned from the previous revised pay-as-you-earn or repay plan. Save is the most affordable repayment plan ever and will save millions of borrowers money on their monthly payments. Student borrowers can visit student aid dot gov forward slash save to sign up today. The application takes less than 10 minutes to fill out for most. And finally, an update on the president and the first lady since she tested positive for COVID-19 last night. I can tell you that the first lady is experiencing mild symptoms and will remain in Delaware for the week. President Biden tested negative last night for COVID-19 and tested negative again today. He's not experiencing any symptoms. As far as the steps he is taking, since the president was with the first lady yesterday, he will be masking while indoors and around people in alignment with CDC guidance. And he, as, as has been the practice in the past, the president will remove his mask when sufficiently distanced from others indoors and while outside as well. The CDC guidelines recommend a combination of masking, testing, and monitoring for symptoms. The president is doing all of that in, con in close consultation with his physician. There are currently no updates to the White House COVID-19 protocols. We continue to work closely with public health and medical professionals to monitor the virus. We're in our strongest position yet to fight COVID-19 and the viruses responsible for majority of fall and winter hospitalizations. As we head into the fall, we have more tools and systems available today to help communities this fall and winter season, including safe updated vaccines that will be available mid-September, widely available at-home COVID tests, widely available effective treatments, which can reduce the risk of severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. We will be encouraging, as I have said before, Americans to get their updated COVID-19 vaccine in addition to their annual flu shot and also RSV vaccines, as you all know. With that, thank you, Jake, for your patience. Uh, Jake is going to talk about the President's travel to India and any other foreign policy questions that you may have. Thank you, Corrine, and thanks to all of you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. And Corrine mentioned my patience. I'm going to test your patience for a moment because I'd like to take a few minutes at the top just to set the scene for the President's upcoming trip to Delhi for the G20. 
and to Vietnam to elevate uh, our partnership with Vietnam. On Thursday, the President will travel to New Delhi, India to attend the G20 Leaders Summit. On Friday, President Biden will participate in a bilateral meeting with Prime Minister Modi of the Republic of India. And on Saturday and Sunday, the President will participate in the official sessions of the G20 Summit. As the President heads to the G20, he's committed to working with emerging market partners to deliver big things together. That's what we believe the world will see in New Delhi this weekend. The United States' commitment to the G20 hasn't wavered. And we hope this G20 summit will show that the world's major economies can work together even in challenging times. So as we head into New Delhi, our focus is going to be on delivering for developing countries, making progress on key priorities for the American people from climate to technology, and showing our commitment to the G20 as a forum that can actually, as I said before, deliver. And thanks to the leadership of Prime Minister Modi and India's presidency, we hope we'll be able to do all of those things. We're also looking forward to warmly welcoming the African Union as a permanent member of the G20, the newest permanent member. We believe that the African Union's voice will make the G20 stronger. Let me say a few more words stepping back about what the United States is bringing to the table as we head into this summit. Here at home, President Biden has worked to rebuild the American economy, as you've all heard him say, from the bottom up and the middle out, by making smart investments in the industries of the future while tackling climate change and empowering workers. And we believe that those investments are paying off. We think countries around the world, too, can uh, benefit from a similar type of approach and that we can help them as well by mobilizing investment to support them in tackling the challenges that they face. And that's one of our main focuses heading into the G20, delivering on an agenda of fundamentally reshaping and scaling up the multilateral development banks, especially the World Bank and the IMF. We know that these institutions are some of the most effective tools that we have for mobilizing transparent, high-quality investment into developing countries. And that's why the United States has championed the major effort that is currently underway to evolve these institutions so that they are up to the challenges of today and tomorrow. Just last month, President Biden asked Congress for additional funds that would have the impact of increasing World Bank financing by more than $25 billion. And we're working to make sure that other partners follow our lead. And at the G20, We've been leading an effort that we hope will see the G20 endorse this level of ambition and uh, deliver a broader vision of multilateral development banks that are better, bigger, and more effective. President Biden will also be calling on G20 members as leaders in the global economy to provide meaningful debt relief so that low- and middle-income countries can regain their footing after years of extreme stress. He'll be clear that the United States expects real progress on ongoing cases by the World Bank and IMF annual meetings in Marrakesh next month, and he will be clear that we need all G20 members to be constructive and at the table with no exceptions. We'll also be making progress on other key priorities, from climate to health to digital technology, including commitments with respect to a more inclusive digital transformation and a responsible path and approach to AI development. In addition, we'll spotlight the progress that we've been making on the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, or what we call PGI. We'll have some announcements that we're excited about. Now, we know that there will be continued focus on how the G20 deals with Russia's illegal and ongoing war in Ukraine. The reality is that Russia's illegal war has had devastating social and economic consequences, and the poorest countries on the planet are bearing the brunt of that. As he has done before, President Biden will call for a just and durable peace, one founded in respect for international law, principles of the UN Charter, the precepts of territorial integrity and sovereignty. And he will continue to emphasize that the United States will support Ukraine for as long as it takes to redeem these principles. Last but not least, and this is important, you'll see that the United States will make it clear that we remain committed to the G20 as a critical forum for all of the major economies of the world to come together for global problem solving. At a moment when the international economy is suffering from historic and overlapping shocks, 
it's more important than ever that we have a work on, working forum with the world's largest economies to deliver meaningful outcomes. So in a sign of that commitment, the United States is looking forward to hosting the G20 in 2026. Now, turning briefly to Vietnam, on September 10th, the President will travel to Vietnam to meet with the General Secretary and Vietnam's top leadership. Building on President Biden's string of diplomatic successes in the Indo-Pacific just this year, this visit is a remarkable step in the strengthening of our diplomatic ties, and it reflects the leading role that Vietnam will play in our growing network of partnerships in the Indo-Pacific as we look to the future. For decades, the U.S. and Vietnam have worked to overcome a painful shared legacy of the Vietnam War, working hand-in-hand -hand to promote reconciliation with our service members and our veterans lighting the way, work that is dear to the President's heart, particularly in light of his close friendship with Senator John McCain. As we survey common challenges on everything from the South China Sea to critical and emerging technologies, the United States and Vietnam will chart out a vision for facing the 21st century together with an elevated and energized partnership. And finally, uh, Vice President Harris will be traveling, is traveling literally as we speak, to Jakarta, Indonesia to attend the U.S. ASEAN Summit and the East Asia Summit and to engage with leaders from across the Indo-Pacific from September 5th to September 7th. Her upcoming visit will be her fourth visit to the Indo-Pacific in two years and her third visit to Southeast Asia. Vice President Harris has met with more than three dozen presidents and prime ministers from the Indo-Pacific. And throughout her work, she has focused on strengthening alliances and partnerships, driving economic growth in the United States, and upholding international rules and norms. At both summits, the Vice President will underscore the United States' enduring commitment to the Indo-Pacific generally and to ASEAN centrality specifically. And we look forward uh, to having her be able to report back to the President on those trips as the President embarks on his own trip to India and Vietnam. Uh, I told you that I was going to test your patience a bit. I think I made good on my promise. So with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah. Given what we know about how COVID works, I understand the president is negative now, but are you planning for any contingencies in case he does test positive in the coming days or, or during the trip? Could he attend any of these meetings virtually? Are you thinking ahead to that? I'll let uh, Corrine speak to COVID planning here at the White House uh, as it's beyond my ken. But of course, we have long experience now from the early days of the administration uh, in managing uh, for situations in which uh, COVID plays a role in summits, and, um, you know, we've seen various leaders at various times participate virtually in events. But in terms of specific contingency planning here from the White House, Kareem can speak to that. And just one more. Uh, on Sunday, the President said he was disappointed that President Xi was not going to be attending the G20, but then he said, I'm going to get to see him. What did he mean by that? Has something been scheduled here? Nothing's been scheduled, uh, but the President has said before that he's looking forward to picking up the conversation that he had with President Xi in Bali last year, and he fully intends to do that in the months ahead. Yeah. Dave, thanks so much. Can you, just following up on that point, give us a sense of the timing? Do you think that that conversation might take place in the coming weeks, in the coming months? I can't give you a sense of timing today. Okay. And on North Korea, very quickly, there are obviously reports that Kim Jong-un could be poised to visit Russia. This comes as the White House has recently said arms negotiations between North Korea and Russia were, quote, actively advancing. What is the latest assessment of the state of play between those two countries? Well, actively advancing captures it well. Uh, our current analysis is that discussions between North Korea and Russia with respect to North Korea providing military support to Russia for its war in Ukraine, that those discussions are actively advancing. Most recently, we saw the Defense Minister of Russia, Russia Sergei Shoigu, make a trip to Pyongyang, in essence, to ask for weapons. And we also have information, as we have indicated publicly, that North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, has some expectation that those dis discussions will continue as we go forward, including leader-level discussions, perhaps even in-person leader-level discussions. Now, I can't get into all the details of what we know, but at the broad parameters, that is what we are seeing. Ongoing discussions and discussions where we have information that uh, the leadership of North Korea sees this as potentially leading to leader-level engagement. And I would just add that we have been discussing publicly uh, 
the possibility of North Korea supplying weapons to Russia for quite some time. And the reason why that there is, there is such an intense effort on the part of Moscow to generate this kind of support from North Korea is that we have continued to squeeze North uh, Russia's defense industrial base, and they are now going about looking to whatever source they can find for things like artillery ammunition. That's what we see going on now, and we will continue to call it out, and we will continue to call on North Korea to abide by its public commitments not to supply weapons to Russia that will end up killing Ukrainians. And any indication of listening to those very public warnings that you've mentioned? Over time, we have not seen them actively supply large amounts of munitions or other military capacity to Russia for the war in Ukraine. I cannot predict to you what will happen at the end of this. I can only say that the discussions have been actively advancing, and the Russians have imbued them with an increased intensity, as reflected in the fact that their defense minister, their number one guy in their defense establishment, actually got on a plane and flew to Pyongyang to try to push this forward. Yeah. Jake, just uh, wanted to talk to you about T20 for a second, but, but just to follow up on North Korea, um, could we get a little bit more analysis of, of how you think this is benefiting the North Koreans or what they want out of this? Do you think that part of this has to do with them getting less than they they want from their traditional patron in Beijing? Do you think that the U.S. has any leverage in terms of what it can do here in terms of either providing food aid to the North Koreans or ratcheting up sanctions? Where's the, the, the room for uh, movement there? So I can't speculate on North Korea's motives. Uh, what I can say is this. Providing weapons to Russia for use on the battlefield to attack grain silos and the heating infrastructure of major cities as we head into winter uh, to try to conquer territory that belongs to another sovereign nation. This is not going to reflect well on North Korea, and they will pay a price for this uh, in the international community. We have also imposed sanctions, specific targeted sanctions, to try to disrupt any effort to use North Korea as a conduit or as a source for weapons going to Russia. We did so as recently as mid-August. Uh, and we have continued to convey privately as well as publicly to the North Koreans and asked allies and partners to do the same our view that they should abide by their publicly stated commitments that they're not going to provide these weapons. What has changed in their calculus is not something that I can speak to. And that's in the mind of Kim Jong-un, and he obviously will be the ultimate decision maker. But we will continue to look for opportunities uh, to dissuade the North Koreans from taking this step, to get others to do the same. Uh, and to report to the world what we are seeing in terms of the actively advancing discussions that are taking place between these two countries. And on G20, just cognizant of the fact that the State Department has blistering human rights reports out on both of the countries that Biden is going to, India and Vietnam, um, including passages uh, about their restrictions on freedom of expression uh, for the media, threats of violence, arrests, this sort of thing. Uh, is that something that the U.S. journalists who are traveling with Biden should expect? And are you taking any actions to ensure their safety? Well, first of all, uh, the ability of the American press traveling with President Biden to be able to go to the G20 and cover the G20 in an unencumbered way is something that has been a serious priority for this White House, for me personally, as recently as just this morning. Uh, and we are putting our money where our mouth is in terms of making sure that American press will have all the access that they need and are entitled to as members of the international press, as members of the White House press. Secondly, President Biden himself has spoken to questions related to democracy and human rights uh, as recently as the state visit earlier this year. Uh, the United States, our position on these issues is clear, is reflected in the statements of our president. It is, of course, reflected in the reports that you're referring to. And when it comes to the trip to Vietnam, we believe that we have a powerful opportunity to advance our partnership in a way that will deliver for the American people and will deliver broader security, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. But we also always raise issues related to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and other basic human rights that are at the core of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This trip will be no exception to that. Yeah. What does it say about the state of Russian supply lines that they're asking of all people, the North Koreans, for help? And is North Korea able to provide artillery and the things you were talking about at a volume that could have any kind of meaningful impact on the conflict? We have asked our intelligence community that second question. It is a good question. Our visibility into 
both the question of quantity of stocks and then, of course, quality of stocks is somewhat constrained. Uh, but it's something that we will continue to look at carefully. I think there is an open question about how much uh, material and what the quality of the material is that could be provided if it were to be provided. And then I think it says a lot that Russia is having to turn to a country like North Korea to seek to bolster its defense capacity uh, in a war that it expended, uh, expected would be over in a week, that in September of 2023, uh, it is going to North Korea to get munitions uh, to try to continue to grind out on the battlefield in Ukraine. Yeah. On the G20, um, my colleague asked the China question, but is the president scheduled to meet with Mohammed bin Salman or Erdogan or any of these other leaders that we might be interested in while he's there? <laughs> Um, I, I don't know who f I laugh because I don't know who fits on the list of who you might be interested in. It's like there are two categories: the ones you're not interested in and the ones you are interested in. So I'm the State Department, or I'm interested in all of them. Okay, those two specific. All right, uh, we don't have a bilaterals scheduled with either of those two leaders at this time. I'm not going to speak to how the schedule will shape up over the course of the coming days. And as you know, there's a certain dynamic element to this, which is all of these leaders in a very confined space. Um, with time on the margins. So some of the bilateral engagements, as you saw last year in Indonesia, will likely be announced at the last minute, and we will do our darndest to make sure that they are done in a way where uh, the U.S. press has the ability to participate in them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Bali communique said that most members of the G20 condemned the war in Ukraine. What progress has been made in the last 10 months to get India and China on board with that position? Well, first of all, India signed on to the statement, most members. It was, uh, as I recall, uh, Russia who was the main objector to the proposition uh, that um, so many of the other members of the G20 signed on to. I don't expect that Russia is going to flip its position on the Ukraine war this year. So. To get absolute consensus on a statement on Ukraine is challenging because you've got Russia seated at the table, albeit not at the leader level because Putin isn't going to be there. But the fact that most members of the G20, as most members of the UN General Assembly, continue to hold the position that Russia's war was illegal in violation of the UN Charter and that this war must end on terms consistent with the UN Charter, that is the result of months of hard diplomacy by the United States and our partners, and it continues to reflect where international uh, sentiment is on this issue. And what assurances has the administration received from the Congress that the U.S. will be able to continue funding Ukraine's defenses going forward? Well, we are working closely with the Congress, as you know, right now on a supplemental funding package that the President has submitted uh, seeking funding through the end of the year. We've been working with both the Senate and the House. We've had constructive conversations on a bipartisan basis in both chambers. We believe we will be able to secure the necessary funding as we go forward. I'm not going to speak to assurances per se, but the conversations have been constructive, they've been positive, they've been substantive, uh, and, and we anticipate being able to work our way through to a sound package so that Ukraine can get what it needs. Yeah. Uh, on World Bank reforms, on the one hand, you've talked about it not being about a specific country, that it's not about China. On the other hand, though, you have uh, said that you need an alternative to the, quote, coercive and unsustainable lending through the Belt and Road Initiative. So, uh, I mean, how can it be about China and not be about China at the same time? Well, we believe that there should be high standard, non-coercive lending options available to low- and middle-income countries. That's a fact. It's also a fact that World Bank reform is not about China in no small part because China is a shareholder in the World Bank. So growing the size, relevance, capacity of the World Bank to deliver for low- and middle-income countries is not against China. It's for the entire international community, all of the shareholders of the World Bank, China being one of them. And we believe that just as the United States would benefit from a more stable, more capable set of low- and middle-income countries being able to deal with their own problems with help from the World Bank and the IMF, China would benefit from that, too. But there is, there is at least a part of it that is focused on China, on those coercive practices of those reforms. This is an affirmative uh, agenda. It is an agenda about providing high standards, transparent, sustainable, uh, resilient 
funding streams to countries that cut through the red tape and give not just the poorest countries in the world, but middle-income countries who are dealing with the stresses of climate and COVID and migration and, and the war in Ukraine access to capital that they can actually take advantage of and put to work. That's not against anybody. That is not a negative agenda. That is an affirmative agenda, positive agenda, and one that's been embraced not just by the United States, not just by our closest allies, but by a very wide range and diverse set of countries. And we believe it will be embraced by the G20 as a whole uh, when we go to New Delhi. And if I may just finally, uh, you mentioned China being the third largest shareholder. How does it impact that Xi Jinping won't be at the table when you're asking for these reforms? Does it does it change the pitch at all, or how does how does that how does that change with them not being there? It won't change our pitch. Uh, and, you know, our pitch has been consistent. Working into the summit, President Biden will reinforce it. Uh, China will have representatives at the table, albeit not represented at the leader level. But the United States is going to put forward the same straightforward, in our view, clear-cut case for why this is so important. And more importantly, we'll also put on the table the fact that we are asking the Congress for financing to be able to make sure that the United States is not just talking the talk, but we're actually walking the walk. Yeah. Thank you. Two on the Saudi announcement today and then one on China. On the Saudi announcement to extend the supply of oil curves, um, can you talk to us about what that means to you geopolitically, how serious it is for the global oil market? We saw crude go above $90 a barrel today. Um, and then separately, does that up the ante for meeting with the Saudis at for like the G20, where you want to do big things with PMs, as you mentioned? So on the first question, I'll leave it to others to speak to the specific oil market impacts. I would point out that uh, what was announced today was a continuation of an existing policy, not uh, a new set of cuts, uh, just a continuation of those cuts for three months as opposed to for one month. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing that the President is focused on is just trying to do everything within his toolkit to be able to get lower prices for consumers at the gas pump in the United States. It's really the price of a gallon of gas for the American consumer not the, uh, the question of which country is doing what here or there that is going to be his ultimate metric for whether we're succeeding or not. Secondly, um, as I said before, we don't currently have bilateral meetings scheduled uh, at the G20 to announce with any leaders. I don't think that the announcement today is going to move us one way or another in terms of engaging with leaders at the G20. Uh, so, you know, we'll make our decisions on that on the basis of a far broader set of considerations than, than any one policy. Does it change the calculation at all, though, for communications in the future with the Saudis? I mean, does it make it more pressing to engage with them on this issue? We have, obviously, regular engagement with the Saudis uh, at multiple levels with their energy minister, with their leadership, and that will continue. And we will make sure that they understand where we stand, and we will come to understand where they stand as well. And the thing that we ultimately stand for is a stable, effective supply of energy to the global markets so that we can, in fact, deliver relief to consumers at the pump, and also uh, that we do this in a way that is consistent with the energy transition over time. China, my Bloomberg colleagues reported that Huawei has reached a breakthrough with its new smartphone that shows it's using the most advanced chips produced by Chinese chip maker SMIC. I'm wondering how concerned you are about this development, and does it prove that the U.S. export controls are failing or that they're violating those export controls? I'm going to withhold comment on uh, the particular chip in question until we get more information about uh, precisely its character and composition. and. For my, from my perspective, though, what it tells us, regardless, is that the United States should continue on its course of a small yard, high fence set of technology restrictions focused narrowly on national security concerns, not on the broader question of commercial decoupling. That is where our emphasis has been. That's where it's going to continue, sort of regardless of the outcome. But in terms of characterizing the chip in question, that's something that we need to gain more information from before we make any definitive comments on it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you see the tension between India and China affecting cooperation, especially with the climate issue in the summit and ultimately affecting the, uh, perhaps the results that could be achieved in the summit? And second, if you allow me, uh, today Secretary Blinken spoke to both Israel Prime Minister and the Palestinian President. 
shall we read into this as more than just a routine call and maybe a serious steps towards normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia? And will the president meet with the Crown Prince on this summit? I think I've answered your last question. With respect to Secretary Blinken's calls, I wouldn't describe them as run-of-the-mill or routine. He speaks with these leaders occasionally, but not every month. But it also does not portend any imminent breakthrough or action with respect to the question of normalization. It's an important moment for a check-in at a high level, and Secretary Blinken is well poised to do that, given his relationships with both men and the central role that he is playing in efforts to explore whether, in fact, a broader normalization is possible. But beyond that, uh, I won't characterize the call. As far as the question of tensions between India and China affecting the summit, really, that's up to China. If China wants to come in and play the role of spoiler, of course, that option is available to them. What I think the, the chair, India, will encourage them to do, what we, the United States, and every other member, virtually every other member of the G20 will do, is encourage them to come in in a constructive way on climate on multilateral development bank reform, on debt relief, on technology, uh, and set aside the geopolitical questions and really focus on problem solving and delivering for the developing countries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I have two questions. Recently, North Korean Kim Jong-un said that it had tested a tactical nuclear weapons by launching missiles. How is the U.S. analyzing this? Second question is, uh, Defense Minister, I mean, Russia Defense Minister Shoigu said that the North Korea Russia maritime joint military exercises are possible. How are you concerned about this? We're sitting in close consultation with both South Korea and Japan on the question of North Korea's advancing nuclear and missile capabilities. I don't have a specific comment on their most recent characterization. They're prone to making a lot of statements of a lot of different flavors. We're just studying each of their individual tests and making determinations about their capabilities accordingly. And then we're responding to that through increasingly tight and interconnected trilateral cooperation, as most recently evidenced in the President's summit with President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida at Camp David. And then with respect to uh, the, the comments by, uh, by Shoigu on the, the military exercises, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Russia looking to do more military exercises with North Korea, that's their business if they should choose to do so. I think if you look at the broader pattern of activity across the Indo-Pacific, the security cooperation, the exercises, the work together on trying to ensure a secure, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific, what the United States has done with a broad network of allies and partners, I believe, has enhanced the stability and security of that region. And the year 2023 has been a year of substantial progress in that regard, delivered by President Biden uh, from our relationship with India to Southeast Asia to Australia to the Pacific Islands and then, of course, to Korea and Japan. So we're quite um, hopeful about the progress we have made in enhancing our own deterrent capability, our own security and prosperity, and we'll let other countries and, and the relationships they're developing speak for themselves. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Brett McGurk is in Riyadh, and so are Palestinian negotiators. Can you update us at all on Saudi Israel U.S. diplomacy talks? And then I have a quick follow up. So, Brett's trip this time is focused on a set of broader regional issues. One of the main things that has brought him there, along with Barbara Leaf, the Assistant Secretary of State of Near East Affairs, and Tim Lenderking, our special envoy for Yemen, is to talk about the war in Yemen. Uh, we are entering either our 17th or 18th month, 18th month of a truce, the longest period of peace in Yemen in years, which has been delivered in part through painstaking U.S. diplomacy. We not only want to keep that going, we want to deepen it and get to a permanent peace in Yemen, and that's one of the main reasons that Brett is there. He'll also be meeting with the Crown Prince of Bahrain in advance of his trip here next week. And then, of course, he will speak to the Palestinians about the whole range of issues uh, relative to um, the is Israeli-Palestinian file. Normalization will be one of the topics on the agenda, but it's not the main thrust of this trip. And like I said before, with respect to the phone call Secretary Blinken made today, we don't expect any imminent announcements of breakthroughs in the period ahead. Does the administration support uh, Palestinians' public demand, though, that uh, they'll accept nothing less than statehood? I'm not going to negotiate from the podium on uh, the question of normalization, how the various pieces fit together. Yeah. 
Jake, it seems like every administration, when it gets into office, complains about the problems it inherits from the previous administration. But how do you defend this administration's role uh, with issues like Russia, China, North Korea, Iran? It seems like in all of those cases, our relationship is worse than it was before. Well, first of all, uh, Russia decided to launch a uh, massive land war in Ukraine. The United States has mobilized not just the West, but a coalition of dozens of countries, and more than 140 countries uh, have voted for a UN General Assembly resolution condemning what Russia did. If you look at the U.S. leadership in that regard, we have stopped Russia from being able to take over a sovereign state. We have ensured that Ukraine will continue as a viable, free, sovereign democracy out into the future, uh, you know, in the support we have given to the brave and courageous Ukrainians out there on the front lines. I think the story of how the U.S. has stood up to Russia and galvanized the world to do so is a significant achievement of President Biden and one that we expect to continue. With respect to China, I'm not sure I'd agree with your characterization of the previous administration, but I'm not interested in comparisons. We're taking our own approach on this which is to ensure that we compete intensively to put the United States in the strongest position possible, while at the same time managing that competition so that it doesn't tip over into conflict. We believe we are managing the competition effectively. And from the question of what we inherited to where we are today, if you look at the U.S. economy and you look at China's economy, if you look at the U.S.'s alliances and the strength that we have built up in the Indo-Pacific and beyond, we feel very good about the strategic position of the United States uh, in terms of the, the unfolding competition. With respect to Iran, I would just point out that under the administration before the previous guy, Iran's nuclear program was in a box. The last guy let it out of the box. We are now trying to manage the results of that decision, and we are doing so while deterring Iran from going for a nuclear weapon. We have thus far been able to do that. It's something we remain vigilant about every day. And finally, with respect to North Korea, uh, the previous administration believed that if it simply engaged in summit-level diplomacy, it could end North Korea's missile and nuclear program. By the time we took office, North Korea's missile and nuclear programs had accelerated dramatically. The most important breakthrough we had seen from them, the first test of an intercontinental ballistic missile, that didn't happen on Joe Biden's watch. That happened before he came to office. So we are dealing with the inheritance, not just of the last administration, but multiple administrations on North Korea. And we are doing so in a way where we have drawn more closely together the U.S., Japan, and Korea in a historic summit that has strengthened our capacity to deter and defend the interests of the United States and our allies and partners going forward. So if you look at the overall position of the United States as it relates to those four countries, as it relates to our broader alliances and partnerships, and as it relates to the underlying sources of national strength, our manufacturing, our infrastructure, our technology, all of this we believe we will leave better than we found it by the time President Biden uh, exits this office. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Um, I wanted to return to the Ukraine supplemental, and you said that you believe that you'll be able to secure the necessary funding. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about why you believe that and whether it's getting harder to, to get those supplementals through Congress, and also why the administration doesn't do more to sell the American public on the need for, for those requests. So, you know, on the first question, uh, our view is that the strong bipartisan support for Ukraine in the Congress, in both the House and the Senate, uh, has been on evidence, has been on display, not just in the past votes for Ukraine funding, but in the current public statements of critical members of both parties in really important positions in the Senate, as well as key chairs of committees in the House. And so we believe that there is still, while there are some dissonant voices, a strong core on a bipartisan basis of support for ensuring that we continue to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs because it's fundamentally in America's national interest to do so. And with the question of, quote, unquote, selling it, the President has made clear repeatedly since this conflict began what the stakes are for the American people, that letting Russia run roughshod over Ukraine would put Europe at risk, and we know what happens when a marauding, aggressive, hostile power places the continent of Europe at military risk. It comes at much greater cost, not just in American treasure, but in American lives later. And so let's make the investments now 
to ensure we uphold the fundamental rules of the international order. The President has made that case repeatedly. We believe if you actually look at where public attitudes are, that they have been surprisingly resilient, despite the constant assertion that the bottom is going to fall out from underneath them. And similarly, we believe support will hold up in the Congress for us to be able to continue to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs. But we don't take that for granted. That's something we need to go work at every day, consult with members, ensure we're answering their questions, ensure accountability for every dollar that's spent, ensure that our allies and partners are stepping up and doing the burden sharing so that they're carrying their fair share of the load. We're doing all of those things, too. And I think in a dynamic discussion with the Congress, we believe that we can secure a good funding package when all is said and done. Do you feel like support is still steady rather than eroding in terms of monetary support for Ukraine? What I will say is we believe that there is still a strong base of bipartisan support in the Congress to pass a material package that Ukraine needs to be able to not just sustain its gains on the battlefield, but also uh, to ensure that those gains can be consolidated and not rolled back as we go forward. Yeah. A member of your team said in recent days that the administration is actively negotiating with the Maduro regime in Venezuela about exchanging sanctions relief for concrete steps toward democratic uh, elections. Do you believe that Maduro has any actual interest in democratic elections? Look, I'm not going to speak to promises, pledges, hopes for the future. The administration's position has been clear and consistent for a long time. We are prepared to engage in discussions about specific sanctions relief in return for concrete steps uh, that lead us towards a free and fair election. So our measurement is not about promises. It's not about what we may get on the come. It is about getting clear, concrete benchmarks and steps along the way. And I'm not going to characterize any current diplomatic discussions in that regard, just to state that that is our North Star. We're going to judge by actions, not by words. And that's how we approach our sanctions relief policy, not just with respect to Venezuela, but other countries as well. And yeah. Just on Haiti, quickly, with the, uh, with the General Assembly coming up uh, at the UN, what kind of priori priority of it is it uh, for the administration to pass a, a resolution through the Security Council uh, that would uh, operationalize a, a multilateral force in Haiti? And what kind of force? Uh, do you want to see, do you want it to have the ability to actually go out front into the streets and Haiti and actually secure, uh, you know, the key, key ports and bridges and so forth? What we're looking to do is to support a multinational force uh, that is fundamentally a policing support mission, not a military mission, and one that is in support of the Haitian National Police, not taking over the sovereign policing capacities from the Haitian National Police. In terms of the precise operational elements of that, how they will operate physically in Port-au-Prince and other parts of Haiti, I'm going to defer that question because the experts are engaging to work out what an operational plan would look like. In terms of New York, it is certainly our priority to get uh, the necessary backing that we feel we need to build for a multinational force and to get the resources necessary. And we've said that we're willing to put forward a substantial investment to do that, and we're asking other countries to do the same. Last question. Um, um, given that you said bolstering the World Bank is not about countering China, in this country, credit card delinquencies have spiked, mortgage rates are through the roof, inflation remains a problem. Meanwhile, the federal deficit this year has almost tripled and the President wants to increase uh, funding to foreign nations through the World Bank. How is that fair to citizens in, say, Scranton? Look, I think citizens in Scranton recognize that problems that happen overseas don't stay overseas. They come here, too, at great cost to working people. COVID came here from overseas. Uh, when there's massive debt or instability or conflict elsewhere, it has a drag on the global economy, and America is part of the global economy. So f our perspective is that for a modest investment from the point of view of the overall size of the U.S. budget to put into ensuring greater stability, greater prosperity, greater capacity in the rest of the world, that is going to end up 
reducing the costs and burdens on working people in Scranton or Minneapolis or any of all, your all's hometowns. And frankly, that's not some novel idea. That has been a bipartisan commitment of the United States for decades. And even the last administration, the biggest skeptic of all of this, made investments in foreign aid because those investments are in the naked self-interest of the United States as well as being the right thing to do. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jake. Right. Thank you, Jake. Uh, I just have two things, and then we'll, we have a few minutes to take a couple more questions. The first one, I actually don't see her in here. It's April Ryan's birthday. I thought she was going to be here. She's not here. Happy 21st birthday, April. <laughs> Um, and then the second thing is I want to say, uh, I want to say congratulations here to uh, Kristen Welker on her last day. We were talking earlier and you said you have covered the White House for about a decade. Uh, so, uh, which makes you what, I don't know, 30 years old, 30, 30. that's great. <laughs> so, um, with, in all seriousness, we will miss you. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, we are incredibly uh, thrilled and excited for you and your new adventure in a, in a, uh, in a different Washington institution, if you will. And so we will be watching. Uh, please keep in touch. And of course, of course, book our people, as you know. Uh, but seriously, in all seriously, this is uh, just for me personally, um, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it has been a joy working with you. And I am so thrilled to have you, uh, to see you uh, in this new world, in this new role that is going to, I think, you know, little girls and boys are going to watch you and hopefully uh, be inspired by everything that you do every every Sunday. So as they have been these past been ten years. So thank you. It's been an incredible honor to cover this administration, the White House, for the past decade. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it, and thank you to all of my incredible colleagues. All right, yeah. Kristen, go I'm forward. So um, okay, uh, yeah, colleague. Okay, it's my birthday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jane, happy birthday. It's my birthday. Oh, all right. All right, Mr. Shear. Happy birthday. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, I know everyone needs to interest me. Now let's talk about news, everybody. But, um, <laughs> it is news. <laughs> uh, okay, the, the COVID protocols for the president. Is he going to test every day before he gets on the plane? Does he have to mask when he's in India? I think there are not... Um, I think the protocols for the G20 are that they're really on. So I wondered sort of what's going to happen going forward with the president while we're watching. Uh, so what I can tell you is that the president certainly is going to uh, test on a regular cadence determined by his physician. Of course, all travelers, all travelers, including the president, will test uh, before traveling to India. So that is uh, certainly something that the president uh, will do. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, the CDC is following CDC guidelines. The CDC does not uh, recommend testing every day after a close contact. That is their recommendation. Again, we are going to follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, they recommend a combination of things, as I mentioned at the top, which is masking, testing, and monitoring for symptoms. He has no symptoms. Uh, so uh, and so we're going to continue to uh, follow those guidelines have those he's going to have those co close consultation uh, with his, his physician and that's all I can share at this time. Can you be more specific on what a regular cadence is? Uh, regular cadence is up to really in consultation with his physician. I can tell you right now as I said all travelers are certainly going to test right before uh, they head out to India and that's including the president so that is something that's happening in what I don't know we're leaving on Thursday so there you go. A couple more logistical COVID yeah. questions. Are these PCR tests that the president's getting? That is something that the, the physician decides on. I just don't have that information. And just uh, reiterate again to us, what is the current COVID protocol for anyone meeting with the president? Yeah. Like senior staff, those yeah. who meet with him every day, brief him. Are you all still tested? So anytime we're around any of the principals, we do test. Uh, that has been uh, that has been the way we have moved forward for the past almost two years here. Uh, so that has not changed. No other no White House protocol uh, is going to be changing, as I said at the top. But when we do uh, have a, a close engagement with the president, the senior staff, and uh, as you all know, or, or anyone, uh, we do have uh, we do test. And just a broader COVID question: We recently did an interview with Dr. Deborah Burks, and she said that. Uh, American leaders are living in a fantasy world amid this latest COVID surge. She said that next month's vaccine booster is coming way too late. Uh, what's your response to that assessment, which she shares with, with some other experts as well? I mean, are you confident that you are as 
prepared as you can be and that this booster is going to, to work? Well, look, uh, we know uh, that uh, we have made historic progress in this nation uh, in this ability to manage COVID, right, uh, in a way that's no longer uh, meaningful in disrupting our daily lives, right? And that is because uh, of the work that this president has done, of the work that this administ administration uh, has done. And we actually believe we are in a better place uh, than we have ever been uh, to deal with COVID. And that's because we have tools in our tool belt, right? We have uh, safe, uh, we're going to have those uh, uh, midterm, uh, midterm, sorry, mid-September uh, Vaccines, which is going to be incredibly important. We're going to we have these home at test uh, at uh, home uh, at home tests, which is absolutely important. We have these treatments that we know are, are effective, uh, so that we can uh, reduce severe illness, we can reduce hospitalization, and we can reduce death. So look, we f we listen to uh, the experts, the scientists. That's what we do here, uh, and uh, and we're co going to be continuously working with them. Uh, certainly in coordination, CDC and FDA announced these midterm, uh, midterm, why do I keep saying that? These mid-September, <laughs> yowzer, these mid-September, <laughs> it passed, yeah, it passed. Uh, so I'm safe. Um, anyway, so these uh, mid-September vaccines, which are going to be incredibly, we believe, in, important. If it's also done, let's not forget, the flu vaccine and also the RSV vaccine, all of those things are important. And this is something that the president had made sure that we are, that is available. We feel, again, we are in a very good position to deal with COVID-19 in the fall. Uh, and uh, and we're taking, we're gonna continue to listen to the experts as we move forward. And just one more, Jake noted, you know, obviously you have some experience on attending summits virtually if need be, but when you look ahead to what the next week looks like and could look like, are you actually thinking logistically through this, should the president, you know, were he to test positive so halfway look, I, there? Or I'm, halfway I'm certainly, I'm just not going to get ahead of that. Uh, what I can say right now is that uh, we do not have any changes to any updates or changes uh, to his travel. The president tested negative yesterday. He tested negative this morning, uh, and he has no symptoms. He's feeling good. You're all you're all going to see him in about an hour and see for yourselves. He, of course, he's going to be very cautious, and we're, we're, he's going to wear uh, a mask uh, as as the CDC guidelines uh, suggest or request. And so, you know that that's that's how we're going to move forward. We just don't have any updates and changes. Uh, I'm just going to just repeat what uh, my colleague Jake said: is that of course we know how to move forward in these situations. But again, you know we feel uh, we, we don't have any updates in in, uh, in any schedule, and the president's feeling fine, and we're going to move forward. On COVID, just to follow on that, is there is there um, the the president did have a bit of a cough yesterday during his speech? I'm just wondering if he had any other symptoms, or if there's any concern about around that. No, no other, no symptoms at all that I can. That's related. Uh, that would be related to um, uh, to to this to this current kind of conversation that we're having. Okay, and then you you mentioned the mid September vaccines, and I'm just wondering because yeah. there is this spike of of kind of incidents that are happening. Is there any concern that that is coming just a little bit too late in terms of the uh, immunization that is in so the look, population now? No, totally understand the question. That is, uh, uh, you know, the experts feel that, uh, again, we listen to the experts, CDC, FDA, they got to go through their process in getting these vaccines uh, done and ready to go. That's going to be mid-September. We're, what, September, I don't know, 5th? What is it? Right? Right? So uh, we're not far from that, from mid-September. And uh, we're going to do our job as we do every time when it comes to new vaccine or anything, any of the tools that are out there. We're going to make sure that we encourage, uh, we encourage uh, Americans to get those vaccines. We know, we know that these vaccines work, right? We know when people stay up to date with their vaccine, that works. Uh, and so uh, that's where uh, I, I'll certainly uh, leave that. Uh, but look, we have seen. Uh, we've experienced increases in COVID-19 during the last three summers, so it's not surprising uh, that we're seeing an uptick in this long period, right? It's been a long period uh, of decline, declining rates, so this is not surprising. Uh, but again, we're going to uh, make sure that uh, when these mid-September uh, mid vaccines are available, that we're certainly going to let folks know and give them the information that they need and also remind them to take your flu, flu vaccine and also RSV shots. All three are going to be key and critical as we get into the and get into the fall. Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, if President Biden does test positive for COVID in the coming days, we can assume he's not going to travel to India. I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. I'm really not. There's no updates to his, uh, to his schedule. That's where we are right now. He tested negative last night. He tested negative today. That's what matters. He's not having any symptoms. Just not going to get into hypotheticals. 
Yeah, Karen. Just a quick follow, and then I want to do another topic if I can. Um, yeah, for sure. So when should we expect the next test update from you? You said the CDC is saying not every day, but he's doing it based on doctor's recommendations. Would he get tested tomorrow and then again on Thursday before leaving? Look, this is something, uh, this regular cadence is going to be up to his physician, a close consultation with his physician. As I just mentioned, all travelers, including the president, is going to get tested before we go to India. We leave, leave for India on Thursday. Today is Tuesday. I don't have anything else uh, further to share. We just shared with you that he tested yes, tested clearly last night. And today, that is that is up to uh, the physician. We are going to continue uh, to follow, the pre as, as well as the president, CDC guidance. Uh, on the UAW uh, possible strike, the president said yesterday when he was asked if he was worried about it, he said, no, I'm not worried about a strike until it happens. I don't think it's going to happen. The head of the UAW said he must know something we don't know. Why is the president confident a strike will not happen? I mean, as you know, Karen, as someone who's followed this president uh, very closely for some time now, he, he's optimistic. He is an optimistic person, uh, and he's going to continue to re remain optimis optimistic as these negotiations continue and that it will result in a win-win. And mem remember, this is a president that believes in collective bargaining. He believes on both sides coming to the table uh, and that uh, with, you know, the, with the UAW being at the heart of an electric vehicle future made in America with good paying union jobs, we believe this is a win-win, right? We believe this is incredibly important. And so uh, we believe as well auto workers uh, should get the wages and benefits they deserve. Uh, this is a president that has been very uh, consistent and and has been uh, um, has has said that over over the last two years. So he's optimistic uh, that both sides are going to come to the table and come to an agreement, as we've seen with other uh, other uh, situations where there was collective bargaining, where both sides came in good faith, and uh, and resulted in a good outcome. And so he's going to be remain optimistic. Uh, he believes, again, in collective bargaining, and that's what we hope to see, that both sides uh, continue to have that conversation. Well, updated on the latest on the negotiations? Uh, so as I mentioned, I think I mentioned this, uh, and you all know this, I think you've reported on this, uh, uh, Gene, Sp Gene Sperling is, has played the lead on, on having those discussions, as well as Julie Sue. Uh, so we've been uh, having conversations, and so he's updated uh, by, his, uh, by Julie Sue and also, also uh, White House uh, senior staffers here, including uh, Gene. And so that's how he's staying up to date. Oh, of I Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, one quick one on COVID. When the boosters are available, can we expect that the president and first lady will get them? Will they do that publicly as they have in the past? So I can't speak to a schedule, but yes, you can expect that uh, both of them will get up their updated uh, vaccines. Like all Americans who are eligible should uh, do so. And then on the potential government shutdown, I understand that the action is largely on the Hill right now, but how does the president see his role in trying to avert a government shutdown at this point? So look, and I've said this over and over again, and I'll continue to say this, there is no reason, there is no reason for Congress to shut down the government. Absolutely none. Uh, they should keep their word, and they should do their job, which is keeping the government open. And uh, we have to, it is, it is critical, it is important. We just heard from the National Security Advisor, right? It is important to, to fund these incredibly vital programs that American people need, and also our troops needs and emergency needs uh, that, uh, that we have. And so there should not be a reason to shut down the government. We believe Congress should do their job. It is their job, it is their job to get this done. Conversations about this in recent days. Can we expect him to? Will he read some of those out if he does? So I, I can't speak to any conversations that he's had. You know, many of these conversations that the president has, we try to keep them private. Uh, I can say, and you heard from you've heard from Jake. He said that there's been uh, extensive conversation on the supplemental, specifically to uh, to Ukraine, on both the House uh, and the Senate side, and how we truly want to see this continue to be a bipartisan. Uh, effort moving forward. And just more broadly, as you're asking me about the, the, the budget, look, you've heard me say that OMB Director Shalanda Young has been very much involved uh, in these conversations. Our, legisla our Legislative Affairs Office has been very much engaged in those conversations, and that's going to, uh, and that's certainly going to continue because it is crucial and it is important that we fund, continue to fund these vital programs. Just very quickly, yeah. and finally, Green, there's been public reporting that he would support a short-term CR, but is that in fact the case that he would sign a short-term CR? So look, we believe that uh, it is going to be up to them 
right, up to Congress what they decide to do. So I'll certainly uh, defer to them. But look, again, the government should not sh be shut down. It should be uh, funded, these vital and critical programs that American people need. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, look, I'll say this. It's clear because the fiscal year is, is coming to an end that uh, Congress will need to pass a short-term continuing resolution to keep the government running. That is clear. That is where we are right now. Uh, uh, and uh, and I think I've said this before, OMB has provided technical assistance. I talked about this last week to ensure there are no disruptions to impact programs uh, the American people rely on as far as how long this should go. Uh, uh, or I would have to refer to Congress on that specific thing. Yeah. Thank you, Corrine. President Biden is the oldest president in U.S. history. Why does White House staff treat him like a baby? No one treats the president of the United States, the commander in chief, uh, like a baby. So there's this quote that says, That's ridiculous. When staff That's ridiculous back claim. What sounded like a call for regime change in Russia, the president, uh, quote, rather than owning his failure, he fumed to friends about how he was treated like a toddler. Was John Kennedy ever babied like that? So look, uh, I'll say this. Um, there's going to be a range, always a range of books uh, that are uh, about every administration, as you know, uh, that's going to have a variety of claims. That is not unusual. That happens all the time. And we're not going to litigate those here. That's something that we're not going to uh, speak to. There is one thing that I do want to, because I think I was asked this question last week by one of your colleagues about this particular excerpt uh, that they uh, were referring to. And so I'll say this, you know, we did see the excerpt, excerpt the, the context uh, of the excerpt, and it seemed to be making the opposite overall point about how the value of his experience and wisdom resulted in rallying the free world against authoritarianism, which is important. We have seen this. You all have seen this. And passage of the most historic agenda in recent history in his handling of foreign policy, like rallying the world around Ukraine, as you just heard from our national security, national security advisor, who laid out in really good questions that your colleagues asked about how the president is moving forward, about Ukraine, uh, about kind of leading into these conversations that he's going to be having at the G20. Why do you think it is that in a Wall Street Journal poll, two-thirds of Democrats think President Biden is too old to run again? Look, here's what I know. Here's what I can speak to. I can speak to that a president who has wisdom. I can speak to a president who has experience. I can speak to a president who has done uh, historic, has taken historic action and has delivered in historic pieces of legislation. And that's important. When the last guy who was in this, uh, in the Oval Office, uh, talked about infrastructure uh, week, it was a joke. And the president passed a pretty important piece of legislation in a bipartisan way because of his wisdom, because of his experience. And now we have uh, infrastructure decade. And it doesn't stop there. It starts last week. We talked about how the president beat Big Pharma something that elected officials and politicians have been trying to do for 33 years, and he's been able to do that. And we introduced 10, the first tranche, the, f the first 10 uh, drugs that Medicare can now negotiate on, right? And it's going to save money for our seniors, for Americans across the country. The, the gentleman that introduced the president, Stephen, who's 71 years old, paying $16,000 a month, $16,000 a month, just to stay alive because he had cancer and diabetes, and he cannot retire because he's because he has to pay sixteen thousand dollars a month, and because of the work that this president has done, he doesn't have to do that anymore. And I'll say one last thing. I know you have a follow up, probably about five more, but let me just say this one last thing: is that the interesting thing about this is that the president has done these historic pieces of legislation, whether it's the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, whether it's the American Rescue Plan, whether it's Chips and Science Act, uh, whether it's the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. There are some Republicans, right, in the House, in the Senate, that did not vote for any of these legislations that I just laid out, who go back to their state, go back to their district, and take credit for something that the president did. So this is not unusual. They did this in 2019, they did this in 2020, and the pre they did this in 2022, and the president continues to prevail. Okay, just one more. The president sure. said over the long weekend that he hasn't had the occasion to go to East Palestine. I just haven't been able to break. The derailment was on February 3rd. President Biden has not had a break since February 3rd. The president will go to East Palestine. He promised that he would, and he will. Uh, you saw him. On, uh, so he was not on a break when he was in Lake Tahoe? 
I will say this again. The President is going to go to East Palestine, as he has said that he is committed to do. You saw him just this Saturday visit uh, a rural area, right, that was uh, devastated. Some parts were devastated by uh, Hurricane Idalia, and he was there with the First Lady. They were able to hear directly from the American people, and he was able to talk about what is it that they need. What is it? What else do they need from the federal government? So the President is going to go to East Palestine. I don't have a time or, or date to announce at this time, but he will go. Okay. Thanks, Great. Given recent events, is there any plans to alter the Vice President's schedule and give her since she's already in Asia to have her own place in case of budget? I, I just don't have any uh, details or updates to share on travel. I'll follow up on my colleague's question. My colleague's question. My colleague's question. Yeah. Can you explain why you can't share or won't share the cadence of the president's testing with us? It seems like a pretty I mean, basic it has, question. It has nothing to not share the cadence. We, I just shared with you yesterday. He took uh, he took a test and it was negative. Today he took a test and it was negative. The CDC does not recommend uh, testing every day after a close contact. That is not my. I, I, I'm I'm. As he tested, you, I'm just saying. You're, I'm just trying to find logic here. You told us the times he tested previously, so it would be helpful if we know. Because it going already forward. happened, my friend. It already I'm happened. Sure. It already that. happened. I right. Right. But so therefore, I can tell you that he took a test because it already happened. Right. And I'm telling you right now. In the evenings going I, it is up to the physician and in close consultation with the physician, CDC. The, guide, the guidance from CDC recommends that or says it does not have to uh, test uh, someone with a close contact does not have to test every, uh, every, regularly or every day. So that is the seat. Okay, well then there should be there should be there should be no confusion. We just explained that he tested. I just explained he tested yesterday. He tested. I was just wondering if you could have an explanation as to why you don't want to share. I just explained it. I literally just explained it. CDC does not. No, CDC recommends. CDC recommends. Uh, that testing does not recommend testing every day. That's something that CDC, we're following CDC guidance. I just did in close consultation with the physician. That's what's going to happen. The physician's going to decide when the testing is going to happen. That's it. That's the answer. I don't have anything else for you. That is the answer that I'm giving you. In close consultation with his physician, CDC does not recommend testing uh, every day. That's it. Go ahead. I'm going to call Sabrina. Go ahead. Thank you, Corinne. I know Jake wouldn't speak to the components of a possible normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel, but Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that the issue of Palestine is more of a checkbox in the negotiations. Does the White House agree with that assessment? Um, look, I'm not going to go beyond. Jake laid out pretty well about uh, our position there, uh, the, the, uh, the meeting that Brett is doing uh, in the region, especially as it relates to uh, Palestine as well. Uh, I don't have anything. I'm not going to go beyond, beyond or further to what the national advisor uh, shared. I, I'm going to go around and take one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. I was going to ask about the deficit. Yeah. Uh, the federal deficit is projected to increase this year over last year. Uh, during Biden's term, it decreased in the first two years. It's going to increase this year. What's President Biden's response to that? And what are his what's his assessment of the reasons that the federal deficit is increasing? So, a couple of things, and I know one of uh, my colleagues have spoken to this before. Uh, deficits from year to year can be volatile, uh, and so that's kind of how. Uh, we have tracked that, but the reality is the president has a real plan, as we've laid out multiple times, to reduce the deficit, and we don't see Republicans having a real plan. And so the deficit has fallen by more than $1 trillion under the president, president, this president, and he has signed legislation to cut uh, the deficit uh, by another $1 trillion. So the president's budget uh, would reduce the deficit by a, a, by further $2.5 trillion by cutting wasteful spending on special interests and making big corporations and the rich pay their fair share. So that's what we're trying to do. And by contrast, what you're seeing uh, from our Republicans co colleagues uh, on the other side is that, uh, you know, especially when President Trump and congressional Republicans, what they did during his uh, administration is that they added $2 trillion to the deficit with a tax cut that skewed, uh, obviously, to the wealthy and large corporations. So what we are going to do is we're going to continue to fight for Social Security. We're going to continue to fight for Medicare, health care. Uh, we're going to continue to make sure we do what we can to uh, the president believes in moving forward with his uh, economic plan in a fiscally responsible way. And so that works. that's what we're going to continue to do here. Why is I just said it can be year to year, it can be very volatile. I mean, he said in March in Baltimore in a speech, yeah. our plan is working, it's decreasing the deficit. 
Right, and, and I and and we have seen the deficit falling by more than a trillion dollars under this president, right? But as I stated at the top, it could be volatile, and that's why the president has taken action, right? More than two trillion dollars uh, to lower the deficit, and that's what he's going to continue to do. Uh, but we know what we know for sure is that trickle trickle down economy does not work. You hear us talk about all the time when we talk about binomics is building an economy from the uh, bottom up, middle out. That's the president's plan. That's what he's going to continue to do, and he's going to do it in a fiscally responsible way. And again, that's all you have to do is watch what the president has done the last two years, and he has done. I, I, I just laid out, it can be very volatile. I just talked about how the president, the president deficit, it can be, but that's the way it is from year to year, it can be volatile. That is something the economic, the economies, the economy, well, talk to an economist and they'll tell you specifically. What I can speak to is what the president has done over the last two years is we see the deficit go down by a trillion dollars. He spent, he, he signed another piece of legislation where the deficit is going to go down another trillion. That is the president's focus. That's why we believe binomics is so important. Guys, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Randy.